Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Niemeyer. I'm a professor of, uh, film, uh, for, of uh, media innovation at the Department of Art Practice at UC Berkeley, and I'm honored to um, welcome today our uh, uh, two speakers, Susan Oxaby and Kate McKay, uh, who are going to talk about uh, how to curate films and talk about the Pacific Film Archive. Uh, this is all part of a class called Video Art in Context, and we're in a module right now called Social Intervention, and I'm teaching this class together with Professor Shannon Jackson and with our amazing GSIs, Jihan Lu and uh, Sachi Mulki, and I also want to acknowledge that the course, which has um, really unique features to it and is uh, unusually well contextualized in the museum with two shows that are related to uh, video art here right now, uh, that that uh, whole course is uh, sponsored by the Kramlick Foundation uh, for Video Art and uh, we're very grateful for their support. So. One of the shows that um, this course is associated with that I highly recommend you go see downstairs called uh, Out of Africa is up right now. It features uh, uh, four, four works, two of them are uh, video works, and uh, they're both uh, really amazing works to engage in. And uh, there's also a show um, that features uh, the video uh, Morakot Hotel by Picha Kong with a Risa Kul, and uh, there is a beautiful still here of that installation, which is quite haunting, and which is meant to be haunting because it's actually about ghosts, and it's about ghosts of the past, uh, lovers of the past that uh, seek to find each other again. And uh, it uh, features this amazing uh, computer uh, graphics uh, effect uh, where um, these bits are floating in the space of an abandoned hotel, and these bits uh, are representatives of spirits that float around. And so uh, Pichapong was able to visualize that, and it became sort of the, the beginning of uh, his uh, investigation in how we can how we can uh, visualize the in-between, maybe. And uh, so uh, when we talk about these video works, we often right now talk about two concepts. One of them is uh, the concept of the work itself and its, uh, uh, um, its uh, impact, but also the uh, concept of the artist's biography and how the artist as an author is positioned through their life experience to speak on a specific issue. In this case, uh, the Cambodian refugee crisis, which uh, Pichapong experienced being in Thailand um, as a young man in 2007. And so, so the work feels very poetic, but of course it has uh, these social intervention uh, dynamics that go on. And in our course right now, um, our students are doing a, uh, an, a video that is a response to these kinds of conversations where we um, ask students to make a uh, social intervention video, and there's an official version of the, jaw, of the uh, um, assignment, and those of you who are not in the class, you don't have to do this, but you can if you want. And uh, there's the, the T, the short version, and it's really just about mentioning, um, about emphasizing the synthesis of the two previous assignments, creative assignment one, which was a video, and that they produced that was really compelling, and uh, also the, um, the second writing assignment, which was an artist biography. So we want to invite you students to begin your work with, with a reflection about your life. What does your biography so far position you to speak on? What kind of authorship comes from your life so far? Next, you can, based on that uh, um, sense of authorship, you can explore what social or envi env environmental issues you want to speak on, and then choose a form that resonates with your biography. If you played lots of video games, uh, use that. We saw a wonderful piece um, earlier this week that a student had made um, based on uh, machinima on video game art. If you love data, use that. If you know how to dance, teach us by all means. Engage your audience with what you know best. So that's what we're working on as students right now. And uh, so that gives you a different timeline. Suppose you were born in 2004, and suppose you're making this work right now. The interesting question becomes, what will viewers make of it in 100 years? What is the lifespan of your artwork? And um, what kind of futures does it project that you make yourself accountable for by making art? Uh, so because, because social intervention really is a process of making yourself accountable. So um, uh, sometimes uh, we have um, people who miss classes. That is a fact, that is a very strange thing. I don't understand, it's mystifying to me. The classes are so amazing, but life happens and people still miss, uh, uh, miss classes sometimes. So if you miss more than six classes uh, in, our, in our course here, you might get, a, get a, um, some, some trouble. So you wanna avoid that trouble. And if you um, almost miss more than six classes though, what can you do? Well, um, we have, we're considering this show, this BAM PFA show, and we're giving you a chance to make up for a missed assignment by doing an additional class project. And so considering the uh, BAMPFA show out of Africa, 
and what artworks do you think you would like to add to the show and why? Curate or create one of these artworks to the show and for the creative option, you can just make a new work of art and uh, for the curate option, um, you have to write a paper uh, addressing the following points that involve uh, a wall label and all kinds of reasons for why you would want to add this work to the, to, the, to, the, to the exhibit. And so this gives us a chance to interact with the exhibit as a live audience that wants to aspire, that aspires to, to contribute through creation or through curation, and that's uh, what I would call a, a living culture dialogue. And I really want to thank Julie Whitholm Rodriguez for making this dialogue possible in this building. So thank you so much. Let's give you a round of applause for that. <clears throat> and so uh, this gives me a chance to introduce uh, Susan Oxby and Kate McKay, our speakers for today. Both of them have a unique feature uh, that they have in common, which is they're bo bo both uh, Canadian, and uh, Susan got her BA from the University of Ro Toronto, but then also uh, got a degree in media production from Ryerson University, and uh, produced two movies, All Flesh is Grass, which has a beautiful title, and uh, Golf War Diary, and then uh, from 1992, and then uh, uh, since uh, a few years now, is the director of film and senior film curator at BAM PFA, and one of their signature initiatives was to produce the Georgian film retrospective, which was, I think, the first uh, retrospective in the United States um, that um, considered national cinema, which is a whole different way of thinking about authorship. So um, that's a very interesting uh, framework as well for thinking about where film comes from, what kind of national conditions produce, what kinds of biographies and what kinds of authorships. Uh, Susan Oxby is also an advisor to the Library of Congress, and I'm very impressed with this because Susan advises the library as to which movies become part of the Library of Congress and therefore part of the um, as permanent as possible record of uh, human cultures in the United States. And so I wanted to invite Susan Oxby to the stage and ask you this very question. Which movie are you the most proud of having inserted into the Library of Congress. Please welcome Susan Oxby. So thank you for doing this today. And which is the movie that you're the most proud of to have in, in inserted into the library? Well, there are many. Are you can switch computers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, the Library of Congress has an advisory board, and then it's the Librarian of Congress, um, Carla Hayden, uh, who actually names the registry list each year. In December of 25 titles, they're making it in. I've been involved with this activity uh, since I was in Toronto um, back in 2005, and I've been on, chairing the avant-garde film study group and I'm involved with the documentary film study group. It's, hard, it's always hard for me to answer questions which I have to pick my favorites, but I do think it's important that um, a word is out. Some, story, some of our stories uh, made it onto the registry last December. Um, Let's see. Uh, there are works by Helen Levitt in the street that have made it on. Uh, Nathaniel Dorsky. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a little, I wasn't quite uh, prepared for this, but the main thing is that we're trying to add a diversity of working styles in addition to a diversity of, of artists um, to the library's board. And it's an incredible group of colleagues that I work with. So I can't take too much credit. I mean, help feed in ideas and, and help um, the larger group, which are largely people in cinema guilds or, or the industry and distribution become more aware of the breadth of cinema history in the United States. So I'm sure I'll think of a couple, a couple more favorites by, <laughs> by as soon as I sit down when I pass this over to Kate Mackay. My talk will be illustrated by um, PowerPoint and a couple of clips. So I hope it goes smoothly, wish me well. And I don't, I wanna see it's, I've got about 25, 30 minutes. I'll try not to um, go over time. So thinking of the work of William Kentridge, I want everyone to be aware of the fact that while Kentridge's in-person residency has now come to a close, there's still a lot going on around Kentridge. And Greg mentioned, um, out of Africa, which is on our lower level galleries. Um, this exhibition runs to the end of April. If you're a UC Berkeley student, you can always have free admission to the Van PFA galleries. And I encourage you to go and see it. And if you're doing that this afternoon, just go back to the admission desk and get a Van PFA sticker. Um, also, um, continuing is, or actually just mounted to our outdoor screen, excuse me. Um, Is a, this is my computer, but it's a very sensitive 
touch. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, Uh, on the Hour is an ongoing series that we present on Bam PFA's outdoor screen, and at the moment, when you walk around the block and look at the opposite side of this wall, there's a wonderful LED screen, and we're running an 11-minute program called Three Short Films by William Kentridge, and um, it runs about 11 minutes. So it's on the top of the hour, and it's also between 12 and 1 p.m. and 5 to 6 p.m. We play that loop for the entire hour. And you really should check that out. I'm going to speak about this um, at the end of my talk, but I um, wanted you to know about that. And finally, here at Ban PFA, orchestrating time, the films of William Kentridge, he actually mentioned to me last week after the AD talk that this was the largest film re retrospective that's been organized of his works. We're showing more than 30, <laughs> I love that, we're showing more, more than 30 of his short films and the way in which he's worked to stage and do the set design for operas, um, as well as um, some documentaries. So this series, we're halfway through. Um, there's a screening this weekend on Saturday at 4.30, a collection of William Century's short films that kind of deal with ideas of theme and variations. And this Sunday, uh, Albenberg's Lulu, an opera, will be shown. Um, and then there's one final screening, The Magic Flute, of course, Mozart's opera. So. I just wanted you to know that that's going on and encourage you to jump in. By way of background, William Kentridge was born in Johannesburg in 1955 of Lithuanian Jewish descent to parents who were both barristers and defended the civil rights of South Africans. With a degree in politics and African studies and training in art, theater, and mime, Kentridge has, over the course of his prolific career, worked across multiple disciplines, including print and drawing, film, performance, sculpture, mural, and tapestry. I want everyone to be aware of the fact that he has an incredible website, and you could spend literally hours or days at this site. It's been an, um, invaluable for me in terms of curating the film series, and uh, every day, or every time you log in, there's something different happening on the homepage. But you can explore in depth um, his career, uh, he has a watching room, a reading room with articles on his work. There's a wonderful chronology. And then literally, you could search any title and find it fully illustrated with all of the credit block details that you'd need to know. So this is a, a great resource for anyone interested in William Kentridge. Um, So yeah, um, in terms of the state, quickly, the stages of his concert, he, career, he was interested in conducting, but it didn't really have the musical training to become an orchestra conductor. So he also uh, was studying and involved with film in the early part of his career. He decided not to go into the industry. He didn't think that was a good fit for his own creative mindset. But by 1975, he began to make short films, including animation, and in just a moment, We'll look at that very first work. Um, often his, his films are based on drawing or relate to drawing series, and they exist alongside many of his film projects. Um, and in fact, it's fascinating when you look at his website, you'll see the relationship between a film and the set of drawings that accompanied that period of his work. He, his method combines drawing, writing, film, performance, music, theater, and collaborative practices to create works of art that are grounded in politics, science, literature, and history, yet maintaining a space for contradiction and uncertainty, which I think is what makes his work so timeless. Kentridge's work has been seen in museums and galleries around the world since the early 1990s. By 1988, he began to work in opera, staging, and directing productions, and um, Film and, the productive, pr excuse me, film and the projected image are at the are a core element of his stage operas, several of which, as I've mentioned, are in this uh, film retrospective at Pan PFA. I first was involved with Kentridge when I worked in Toronto at Cinematheque Ontario, and in 2000, the Art Gallery of Ontario hosted a major Kentridge exhibition, and at that time, he was the guest of the AGO and Cinematheque Ontario, and um, we presented a series of his animated films. I've continued to follow his work, which is often shown at film festivals like the Rotterdam International Film Festival in the Netherlands and at 
galleries in Rotterdam, or much more really recently for Bay Area art goers, of course, when SF MoMA reopened in 2016, they devoted a whole gallery to the refusal of time, a very, very important installation piece by William Kentridge. Um, in terms of observations about his working style, I'm just going to show a few slides that relate to um, uh, a work called Journey to the Moon and a related installation piece called Seven Fra Fragments for Georges Méliès. So I think it's important for us to understand that William Kentridge's cinema is in the tradition of the seminal French filmmaker Georges Méliès. Indeed, Kentridge's Journey to the Moon from 2003 uh, which we screened um, on the first night of our retrospective, is a tip of the hat to Méliès's A Trip to the Moon from 1902. And further, it's important to understand that Méliès was a magician with cinema in the early days of silent cinema, using all kinds of camera techniques, be it stop motion or, or um, superimposition irises. All of these aspects of the language of cinema are ones that Kentridge uses, his, uses in this beautiful, beautiful work from 2003. Um, I also wanted to mention um, that it's so important that Kentridge has a love of ephemeral materials and objects from bygone areas. We see this both in his filmmaking and his installation work, and it's really quite special. He is a performer, at times behind the camera stand, shooting frame by frame and then adjusting the image and filling again. At other times, he's performing for the camera um, um, as the film's subject in a, mar in a marvelously imaginative approach to filmmaking in which, really, Kentridge is orchestrating time. Um, you know, so I wanted to, let's see. I wanted to just show these slides and then say to Doug up in the booth that I actually blew by the uh, first clip. But let's do that now. It's a minute, <laughs> and as I said, the very first film that William Kentridge made in 1975 is a one-minute film, and I think you'll have a kick seeing it, so let's do that now. And this is a silent work made with a magic marker. <laughs> that work is Discourse on a Chair, William Kentridge, South Africa, 1975, one minute silent. Very inspiring for anyone who's wanting to get involved in filmmaking. Obviously, this is the basis of Kentridge's um, aesthetic in film. He works with a frame-to-frame -frame relationship. If you haven't um, thought about cinema deeply before, film is projected at 24 frames a second sometimes 25 frames a second, and in digital, sometimes slightly higher frame rate. But the most important thing is that Kentridge is using the building blocks of cinema, the, the, the single individual frame, in much of his work in a wonderfully creative way. Um, we, what we're looking at are these static images, and the, eye, the human eye creates what we sense is an illusion of movement. And so, again, this is connecting William Kentridge to the early filmmaker, Georges Méliès, and this early sense of the illusion of, of movement in cinema. And so, Kentridge just takes it in so many different di directions in so many ways, which we'll see. Um, so, as a multimedia 
artist, William Kettridge, uses the projected image um, from single channel. That's what we call when we're presenting a film in a theater. This is a single channel work. When we're showing work in a gallery situation, Kentridge may use multiple screens, as many as five or six, to create a work. Um, and then sometimes he's adding ephemeral materials around that, or objects. Um, his films are an integral part of his creative process, and in them he explores ideas of metamorphosis and the manipulation of time. His animated films are often concern themselves with themes of self-portraiture, memory, loss, cultural displacement, and political oppression. He also works in live action film in a variety of ways, exploring themes and variations. As I mentioned, our screening this Saturday at 4.30 is a nice way of grouping some of the films that are in this mode. Um, and on occasion, the discourse of social and political history are shown from very distinctly from his point of view as an artist. And so that's always interesting to be kind of trying to interpret and pull apart what it is that Kentridge is doing thematically. Um, it seems as if always what's central to his um, working style is starting with ideas in the studio. This could be something as small as drawing an individual frame or dealing with some element of movement that he wants to capture and then weave into a larger uh, film production or perhaps into an opera or an installation piece. Um, but he's on record as just saying how important um, his creative process is tied to his time in the studio, working independently. But then, of course, he's an amazing artist because he works with teams of, of collaborators um, in many different ways. Um, it is exciting to think about how he, the dialogue of his inner thoughts. Um, and I feel that one of the central aspects of appreciating Kentridge is how he understands life's lessons and how he gets at um, wisdom and how he's sharing that with us. He has an incredible sense of humility and humor in his work. And um, let me see. Let's go to the, uh, the second clip. And actually, I'm going to take the luxury of running this one straight through, because it isn't part of the retrospective. And I do think it's very illuminating about many aspects of Kentridge. Doug? This interview for the New York Studio School is conducted on Sunday, the 3rd of October at 9.15 p.m. 9.05 p.m. Now, we have three minutes, so please keep your answers succinct to the point and make them accessible to a general public and audience that is listening. Can you describe your life as an artist? I mean, can you rather say what it was that you did today to give us some sense of how you fill your hours between waking and sleeping every day? I mean, can you tell us about what, okay, what I mean, if there was inspires enough time, you? I mean, I would be able how are so your... many different things that one could begin to spin out for everyone here? But it's just that there's such a short to explain how one gets from He's not saying anything that's interesting at all. I mean, he's not talking no about truth or truth and beauty or about mystic truths that are revealed by the artist to the, to the compulsion. I mean, he's talking to about to mayonnaise. Can, I mean, if I could just explain these things better to... Tabasco sauce. To all right, let's talk, let's talk about inspiration. I mean, would you say that your inspiration is, comes from Skies as coupled colored what? as a brindled cow. Look, that's Hopkins. Gerald I Manning. know it's Hopkins. I have read everything that you have read and more. All right, here's a question. Can one teach art? 
Yes. No. I write that down. No. I mean, either you have the ability to make art or you don't. Would you agree? No. I write down, yes. I mean, what makes you tick? I mean, can we get one word of truth out of you? We'll wait here to hear the answer. I will outwait you. Bitter year for bitter year. Okay, all right, all right. Um, at least can you describe how you make your work? I mean, perhaps it's, perhaps it's like um, an image that you have in your head and you start at the top and you pull this image, this image comes closer and closer towards you. Or, or do you start with a blank sheet of, do you start with a blank sheet of, of paper and then slowly you find this intermediate membrane between yourself, yourself and the world that enables you to navigate your way It's really of no value whatsoever. Feeble. Feeble. I don't quite know what he's doing here this evening at all. That concludes our interview. So that work is part of a series that is called a drawing lesson series. Um, and next, I want to just uh, cover quickly one of the most important series in Kentridge's careers, which, career, which is called Drawings for Projection. He's worked on this series for more than 30 years, from 1989 to 2020. It's an 11 film cycle. And I think the eighth or ninth work is the one called Other Faces, which is currently on display in the Out of Africa series on the lower level galleries. Um, drawings for projection um, follows two characters, Soho Eckstein, Eckstein and Felix Teitelbaum, on a project which Kentridge has described as self-portrait in the third person. It's a work that questions history in many subtle ways, um, and it, it the narrative thread um, following those characters also deals with themes of memory loss, cultural displacement, and political oppression. Uh, Kentridge works without a script and employs handcrafted animation techniques. And this is a real devotional type project in the sense that he is devoting so much time, weeks, months, years, on these 11 works and how they link outwards to his total body of work. Um, his distinctive use of charcoal, pastel, ink figures, and, and augmentation. He, he works by redrawing the primary image, erasing it, adding to it, and he said that the smudges of erasure thicken time in the film, but they also serve as a record of days and months spent filmmaking, a record of thinking in slow motion. So it's a work of incredible richness and depth and complexity. Um, one senses his quest for understanding and his appreciation of wisdom, uh, the way he grapples with South Africa's history um, over the decades of the 20th, 20th and 21st century. Um, it is a so, there's a lot of social commentary in this, but Kentridge is always working in satire in terms of social critique. Um, and it's very self-reflexive as a piece. 
And it also represents a lot of his joy in terms of the magic of, of transformation and, and metamorphosis. Let's see, Doug, we're gonna, oh, yeah. We're, we are gonna see a clip from Tide Table, and I once again have a slide here reminding you of the other faces uh, piece within this series that's also an in installation work. So let's uh, now once again take a look at a very short clip from Tide Table, and I want you to be looking for his use of animation, his use of rhythm, how he's working with charcoal, um, the types of images that are important to him, if it's the African landscape, the people, um, a sense of history. Here, let's, let's take a look. table, a work from 2003 that runs in total nearly nine minutes. Um, beautiful sense of visual metaphor and transformation. It's important in relationship to this course and to the questions that um, Shannon and Greg posed of us to at least um, look at some images from the refusal of time. A work that is a five-channel projection piece um, for a gallery with megaphones and a breathing mas machine. So here's an image of, of that work. Originally it was running 24 minutes and I think he extended it to 30 minutes. Um, SF MoMA and MoMA jointly own um, this work and it was installed at SF MoMA in 2016 and for several months. Um, I know many people went to see it repeatedly. It is an absolutely masterful piece by Kendridge. Um, another image, you can see the, the, the Five, the five screens um, of projected imagery. This wooden structure in the foreground is what he calls the breathing machine, and it gives this sense of rhythm, the rhythm of life, the rhythm of music, and just it helps help 
helps almost as if, it, as if it's the machine propelling the piece. But then there's a lot of other stuff going on. These megaphones have sound coming from different areas of the gallery. Very complex, very beautiful. This is an earlier drawing for the series. So again, Kentridge is a, in fine art and his drawing and print work is often sketching out ideas in the studio that will then be reflected in either animation that's projected in his installations or just part of a drawing series. I'll gloss on this very quickly. I encourage you to come to the two operas that we're presenting, Lulu this Sunday at, at 12.30, check the guide, the program guide. Um, but we just last week screened The Nose, Dmitry Shostakovich's work, massive um, opera, and the Met Opera in New York uh, um, commissioned Kentridge to create a stage production doing both the sets and um, the direction of, of the stage piece. It's incredible. Uh, as is Lulu, this one's showing this weekend, Albenberg's Lulu, and so Kentridge is, with his opera work, he's um, using the projected image in very great ways. He's using his sense of collage in terms of gathering typography and having that on the sets. He's working with the actors in terms of the nuance of the interpretation, and of course with the conductor and, and orchestras. Coming up on April 2nd, a Sunday afternoon, we'll show Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's The Magic Flute with production by Kentridge. And this was a very important work from 2012 where he was using the projected image. I'll end with um, secondhand reading. And this work will, is currently screening in a silent version on the outdoor screen. And we're going to take a qu quick look at maybe, Doug, just the first um, minute or so to save time. And I'll just say a couple of words at the end and then pass it off to Kate Mackay. So there's a lot to unpack in this work. It's a work from 2013. You can watch it in its full form on the outdoor screen, silent. And this is great. Kentridge just said, OK, yeah, show it as an installation on the outdoor screen without the track. But And we um, do present this work here in the theater on Saturday afternoon at 4.30. But you can see his interests um, in stream of consciousness thought, transformation, language, abstraction, and time. And really, the time thing is essential there, because he's filming each image t t with two frames of stop motion cinematography. And, um, but it is this amazing puzzle that he's giving us. He's showing us an open book, what appears as an open book, and then his layering in of an animated um, poetic work, um, playing off of the sense of reading a film and reading a book, reading an image. Um, Anyway, I hope you'll have fun with his work and um, get to know it better. If we could ever acquire some for our collection in terms of the film archive, that would be amazing to look at these re films repeatedly. Thanks for your attention. I'm going to welcome my colleague Kate Mackay to speak about a pitch phone.
Just something to look at while we start. Um, actually, maybe we don't need anything to look at. Uh, so I'm Kate Mackay. I'm the Associate Film Curator here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And I'm very happy to be with you today to talk about our film series, A Pitch Upon Where Asethikung's Cinema of Now. Um, some of the questions that were raised in the description of this talk, um, I'm just going to read them so we can keep them in mind um, as, we, as we think about his, A Pitch Pong's work. So, how does the moving image change when relocated from the cinema, cinema or cinematheque to the gallery or the museum? museum? Does this changed spatial experience create a different aesthetic experience? Does it create a different political experience? Um, so I have kind of answers to all of these, my own answers, and probably you guys have answers too because you've been thinking about this this semester. And maybe we'll have time to discuss them at the end, but I'm not going to address them off the top. Um, but I'd like to start the presentation uh, by looking at a short film um, by a Pitchapong called The Anthem. And this, this short is from 2006. And he made it sort of as an act of resistance and, and also a cinematic blessing. So when he was going to the movies, every, every film in Thai film theaters was preceded by the national anthem. And so this, is, this film is a, an alternative anthem. Um, so we'll just watch that right now. So I think we take all the blessings we can get and we thank a, a Pitchapong for this amazing, um, amazing contribution. I, I think it's, it, this is classic a Pitchapong. It's an act of resistance at its most subtle, beautiful and insistent. And I was, when I was thinking about how, how to, what to compare it to earlier today, I was thinking like it's the, it's the filmic version of Colin Kaepernick's Taking a Knee when uh, the American National Anthem is playing. So it's just inserting itself, you know, causing you to pay attention to, to the situation in which you're in. And in Thailand, uh, where the, the, um, the, they've had subsequent oppressive regimes. Uh, Pitchapong has suffered a lot of um, censorship of his work and there, you know, military coups are always a, a, a part of, the military is part of all of his films. They're in the edges and the borders and, and national trauma is always part, one of the characters in his films, even if it's in the background. So I think this, this act of resistance is really, um, kind of brilliant and beautiful and kind of sets the tone for what he wants to, what, what he's doing with his cinema. And I hoped it, that it would have set the tone for our film series, which started a couple of weeks ago. And I, start, I, lo I launched the series with this film along with his uh, film, Cemetery of Splendor. And this will, that same program bookends the, the whole film series and it will be shown again at the end. So I thought that was a nice way of of bookending this sort of extended series of his works. One of the great pleasures of working at a film archive or cinematheque or museum is the chance to engage in an ongoing exploration of connections and conversations across the ever-changing landscape of art and cinema history, um, both historical and contemporary work, and, and the relationship of those works to the world at large. And another one of the great pleasures is sometimes being able to engage with living artists about their work. So this series is one of those great, great, great opportunities. So I'll give you a little bit of background because I know you're thinking about a little bit about curation in this series. Um, so Ban PFA has shown a pitch pong's work in the past. Um, he's not a stranger to the museum. Um, in 2007, his installation Muricot or Emerald was shown at the museum. 
and there was a film, a small film series uh, that complemented his installation called Closely Watched Films with a picture from Farasathakun, and he was here to talk about his films, and he showed that we showed Blissfully Yours, one of his early works, along with Tropical Malady. And Tropical Malady, both of both these films you can see in our series coming up. Um, with Tropical Malady, he actually, it showed twice, uh, it showed one night, and then the next night, he we showed Tropical Malady, and he spoke through it. So he stopped and started the film, and, and really talked about it in detail. So a very, a very, very close reading of the work, which is a, a really, really interesting way to approach uh, the showing of sort of a feat, what would be considered a feature narrative film. So that was, it was really tempting to think about, to try to do that again, but um, I resisted because <laughs> this series is something different. Um, and, and, and so I'm going to give you, I'm going to rewind a little bit back. Um, when I was interview, when I was interviewing for the job of associate film curator back in the fall of 2015, I was asked to present three potential film series as part of my interview. And, and a pitch pong where Seth Kung retrospective was one of the series that I presented. Um, so it's taken a while to get around to it, but it's it's always been on the back burner. It was a priority both for Susan and for Kathy, who you know who who's on whose radar a pitch pong clearly is. Um, but last year, with the imminent release of G, a book by Jean Ma, so it's a Berkeley alum who's teaching at Stanford in the art department. Um, she has a book called At the Edges of Sleep, Moving Images and Somnolent Spectators, um, which is based around um, Apichapong's work and his relation and the relationship of his work to sleep and dreams. And it's a wonderful book. You can get it in our bookstore. I would highly encourage you to check it out at the, in the bookstore or at the library. Um, but with the release of her book, we were like, oh, this is a great opportunity to invite a pitch upon and maybe we could do something together and have a conversation about your book. Um, and then as we were beginning to think about how we would show it and when and when the book was gonna be released, um, late last spring, um, Stephen Best, the newly appointed director of the Townsend Center for the Humanities, reached out to ask if we would be in interested in collaborating to bring a filmmaker um, to present the prestigious Unis lecture. And well, on the top of his list was a pitch pong where Sothakung. So um, that I was like, well, how, well, you have perfect timing. We, we, this is already in motion, and we could certainly use your help um, to, you know, attract a pitch pong to come. And and so that's sort of another lesson about curation. Uh, it sometimes helps to have um, help. And it helps to find your network of other people who are interested in the same things and to collaborate. And this doesn't have to be on the level of a, a university or a cinema tech working together. This can be on the level of, you know, your film club or other filmmakers, or if you're in a group of artists, you find your cohort and work together, look at each other's work and show each other's work. And before you know it, you know, it, it turns into something else. Um, and it never stops, so it's always, it's, this is a, just a, an amazing opportunity when all these forces came together. And so once all those things were in place, I started to think about the shape of the series, um, sort of a retrospective around a residency, because a pitch pong will be here f um, in Berkeley from uh, April 6th to the 11th, um, presenting films almost I think, every day. Um, but of course, we couldn't. I didn't couldn't fit all his all his works in that short time, and nor would I want to. Um, so we decided to spread it out uh, across the spring schedule. So we're showing 22 films, including all of Verasethakung's feature-length films, several mid-length works, and a number of short films, even though I really hate the term short film. And if anyone can come up with an alternative to that, I would love to hear it, because 
I mean, I, I once heard a, a friend of mine once told me that I guess Samuel Beckett was being interviewed by a journalist who said, oh, Mr. Beckett, when are you going to present a full-length play? And he said, all my plays are full-length, uh, which is kind of obvious, you know. It's still a painting if it's this size. So anyway, in, but we still say short films because we haven't come up with an alternative. Um, but these, so, so it's a really a, an opportunity to look at a lot of, diff, of Ferris Seth Kung's work. Um, over the course of this semester. And tonight we'll be presenting a double bill of Mysterious Object at Noon, um, his work from 2000, and Worldly Desires, uh, a slightly later work for, that was made between uh, 2001 and 2005. Now, as of course you know, um, Pichapong doesn't limit his practice to making movies for the cinema. He's also, since the start of his career, created moving image installations for galleries and museums, and I'm delighted that Rosalind Keough decided to include his installation, Muricot, which showed in uh, 2007, and is in our collection here at BAM PFA, um, in the galleries as part of her exhibition, Endless Knot Struggling for Healing in the Buddhist World, which is currently on view downstairs and I, I it's, it's an amazing show the whole the whole of it is wonderful and it's really interesting to think about to, to visit that show and think about um, a Pichapong's work in that context because he is def he is most definitely an artist who's grappling with with Buddhism as as part of the elements that he brings into his films so if you want to take a look at um, at his installation or the other works in the Endless Knot show, please just ch check in with the, our visitor services desk and they'll give you a sticker to visit the galleries. Um, it's always interesting to work with artists and filmmakers whose practice includes works for cinemas, galleries, and other platforms. And so there, uh, there are uh, examples of, recent examples of that here at BAM PFA are the works of Pat O'Neill being shown as a matrix, matrix exhibition in the galleries and in, in, the, in the theater. Also, Arthur Jaffa, which I co-curated with um, Absar de Quinzio. Of course, we have William Kentridge here now, but, and it's also interesting to think about artists like Scott Scar Stark, Carrie Laitala, Al Wong, and Jody Mack, who we, whose works um, some, some of Al, Al's work we've shown in the galleries, but these artists are also um, have performance elements in their works, as does a Pichapong in some of his works. So those are artists who have, who've had film screenings in the theater, but they're not just single screen projections, they all have performative elements. Uh, when I was researching this series, I came across a letter that where Sethikung a wrote to an online film magazine in May of 2020. And that's the letter that inspired the title of the series, A Pitch Pong for Sethikung Cinema of Now. And I think it's a really useful introduction to his way of thinking and working and being and sort of helps set the mood for the films we'll be watching in the series. So I'm just gonna bear with me when I read, I read some of this letter. He said, this, this morning, I was thinking about a word, journey, and how we have related to it. When we're young and on a road trip, our restless mind prompted us to repeat, are we there yet? When are we going to arrive? As we grew older, we paid more attention to the passing scenery. We observed the trees, the houses, the signs, the other vehicles. We trained ourselves to be calm on a journey. We knew there was a destination. A movie itself is a journey. It drives us towards different dramatic points. Along the way the point, to the points are fillers that function like mini destinations. The more seamlessly a filmmaker fills the, fills the path and makes the audience forget about time, the closer he or she is to the art of filmmaking. At the core, the costumer, the makeup artist, the boom man, the lighting team, the editor, the musicians, and so on, all work hard to propel the audience um, to the destination. And then he says, unlike a movie, 
this COVID-19 journey's destination is vague. And remember, this was written in May of 2020. Unlike a road trip, we're not moving. Most of us stay put in our homes. We look out our windows at the same scenery and we keep looking. We feel the vulnerability of our mind and body. We are aware of our clocks, internal and external. My morning routine has been established. I remember each step I take as I prepare breakfast. I remember what the sun's direction is outside at any particular time. To keep our sanity, some of us have embraced mindfulness techniques. We try to observe our surroundings, emotions, actions, time, impermanence. When the future is uncertain, the now becomes valuable. This morning, after breakfast, a plate of fruit, Weetabix cereal, and two boiled eggs, I imagine a scenario. Perhaps this current situation will breed a group of people who have developed an ability to stay in the present moment longer than others. They can stare at certain things for a long time. They thrive on total awareness. After we've defeated the virus, when the cinema industry has woken up from its stupor, this new group as moviegoers wouldn't want to take the same old cinematic journey. They've mastered the art of looking at the neighbors, at the rooftops, at computer screens. They've trained through countless video calls with friends and through group dinners captured in one continuous camera angle. They need a cinema that's closer to real life in real time. They want a cinema of now, which possesses no fillers, nor destination. And the letter continues in it to, to really fanciful ends um, and meanderings. But I think it's really interesting when approaching a pitch punk cinema to think about how we are present for it, how he makes us present for it. And I have to say, when I was trying to find clips to show, it was kind of impossible because his, <laughs> I mean, in our time frame, because you know the clips that were sort of worthy of showing were maybe 10 minutes long, because he works a lot with long shots and uh, it, it takes time for you to kind of become present in the shot. And he's really, really interested in creating a space for the audience to be present. He thinks a lot about opening up spaces for audience uh, in the way that he presents his work. So I, I was reading, he was talking about Tropical Malady, which is, you know, like many of his films, in an urban environment and in a rural environment in the jungle. And he's saying that there's so much darkness in the films and, and the audience has to struggle to look and see what's going on in the midst of this darkness. And he's like, that, that creates a, a place for the audience, a way for the audience to be, be present in a way that you're not necessarily when you're just seeing a progression of images in a, a relatively normal movie. Um, so I just thought that that was interesting to think about. Also just to think about his idea when he's talking about travel and journeys and destinations. Many of his films include journeys and travel and car travel and um, foot travel and motorcycles. There's almost always some sort of driving scene in his films. And Mysterious Object at Noon, which we're, which we're screening tonight, is, is no exception. It's basically, it's kind of like a storytelling road trip across Thailand. It's his first feature and it took him a couple of years to make with a very small crew as he went across the country to meet different people and had them sort of elaborate on the same story. And this was the, the first film he made out of, I think, no, I'm getting ahead of myself, so that's all, that's all I'll say for that now. But where Seth Cole sees cinema as a natural extension of the biological need for humans to dream, our ancient impulse to illuminate dark spaces and to play with light and shadow. And, and this, this impulse, this very, what he thinks a fundamentally human impulse, finds all kinds of new 
expressions as technology changes. And so as we know, we're surrounded by moving images on big screens, small screens, in cinemas, in galleries, in shopping malls, in the backs of taxi cabs. So, I mean, this is, this is what a picture pong thinks is human and, and absolutely normal. And sleep and dreams are, you know, ubiquitous in a picture pong's work. So, so much so that they've inspired Jean Ma's book, which I, I, I referred to earlier. And, and she talks um, about some of his works that feature sleep and also some of his installations, particularly jumping off from an installation he presented at the Rotterdam Film Festival, where people would stay overnight in sleeping cots. Uh, and as the, 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 the film images that he had gleaned um, from the iFilm archive in Amsterdam sort of un unfurled on the screen. Now, a Pichpong was schooled in architecture in Khon Ken, Thailand, and it's interesting to think about his relationship to architecture because he, he is a, actually one of the great cinematographers of the built environment. He has a very keen sense of architecture in, in his films, and there, it, which is usually marked in its contrast um, to landscape. And let's say I had, I had a... It was hard to find a good image of his use of architecture, but if you see, this is sort of an underground space in, in a hospital. This is, a, this is from a, a Syndromes and a Century, which we'll be showing on um, April 8th. And then more sort of architectural spaces. This is a hospital where um, in Cemetery of Splendor, where soldiers are being cared for as they sleep. They have a sleeping illness. Um, and, and so you see architecture plays a big role. Also, when you think of a building, the built environment, excavation, digging, um, are, uh, those things are often going on in the background. So you're always thinking of the earth, what's under it, what who may be under it, and, and what might emerge from, from these excavations. Um, after studying architecture, he decided he, he made a couple of short videos and decided he wanted to study film. So he came to the US, to the Art Institute of Chicago, and, and really since his time there, he's been creating his own cinema of now. Um, but, but like all great artists, it's really interesting to think about what their influences were. And when he was at school, art film school in Chicago, um, he cites a bunch of different influences, including the films of Bruce Bailey and Len Lai. Bruce Bailey, of course, is a Bay Area filmmaker um, who founded the Canyon Cinema and whose will be whose films some of fil whose films are in our collection and we'll be showing at um, when a pitch pong gives his una lecture conversation uh, with um, help Knowles, we'll be showing a, a film by len Lai, free radicals along with that talk and uh, bruce bailey's valentine de la sierras um, uh, where south Kung also cites coppola's the conversations B movies, disaster movies, Iranian cinema, um, as well as artworks that he saw in the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, specifically like the, the, the boxes of Joseph Cornell. And it's really interesting, another artist who worked in cinema and you know, in sort of tiny wee installations. And when you think of the boxes and the, that Cornell created, he has these sort of exquisite little universes, and uh, Petrofong's films kind of work the same way. His stories unfold, he was also, other, other influences are from even, even earlier. They're from folk tales and soap operas that he watched in Thailand as a kid growing up. Um, his stories unfold unhurriedly, encouraging viewers to transcend narrative expectations, be present, and to become attentive to time and space, the beauty and the mystery of the moments depicted and the environments in which they take place. So 
there, as I mentioned, there are a lot of road trips, and he he talks about how when he was making Mysterious Object at Noon, he was thinking about how looking out the window of a car is looking like a, looking at a film strip, and he talks about his experience cleaning films um, in the library as a student in Chicago and, and looking at this strip with all this information and all this images, this tiny, delicate strip, and he sort of preserves that impulse in the view through the car windows in, in his films. So he's drawing on childhood memories, folklore, dreams, and science fiction, and the stories of his subjects, actors, and friends. The films are attentive to the spiritual resonance of the mundane details of day-to-day -day life, and like, like we just saw in the anthem. And they often depict journeys from town to the wilderness and or encounters with the spirit world. And that, I mean, a great example of that is, where is like, and this is from Uncle Boonmi, who can recall his past lives. And uh, this is an encounter around the, the dining table of this dying man as his family, living and unliving, all come to visit him, including his, his missing son, which comes, who comes out of the forest to, to visit the family. Um, yeah, the spirit world. So set in former conflict zones or in the shadow of oppressive, oppressive political regimes, primarily in rural northeastern China, where he grew up, he obliquely chronicles endurance and resistance to oppression and the haunting effects of trauma on the lives of ordinary people. And you see that in a lot of his films. Um, in Blissfully Yours, a character is, is explaining to the other character that the, the, in the middle of this idyll that the forest is full of the spirits of Japanese soldiers who were killed in the Second World War. You see um, in Uncle Boonmi, his family, and he's haunted by the communists that he killed when they were in his area, when he was doing what he thought was right for the state. And in Memoria, a Pichapong's first feature made outside of Thailand um, is an expansive exploration of the permeable border between the natural and world and the spiritual realm. And it features, like many of his films, strange afflictions and haunted landscapes. Um, and like all of his films, it's sort of a gentle but insistent reminder that no matter how deeply they're buried, collective traumas continue to reemerge as memories and dreams. Um, so things to look at when we're watching a pitch of Pong's films over these weeks are long takes, his, his very subtle use of sound, you know, scenes where people are sleeping or dreaming. So we have people in repose, people sleeping or dreaming, spirits or ghosts, um, illness and affliction. He was the son of two doctors who worked in a rural hospital. And he often talks about affliction, illness, doctors, doctor's appointments show up in almost all his films. And he, he sort of reflects on his own afflictions and also the space and time of illness and being in the hospital. And he talks about how as a child it felt like the hospital worked in a different space, a different temporal area than life outside the hospital. And for any of us who have ever spent any time in a hospital or have had friends in a hospital, you know that's really true. It's like it's, it's, a, it's a separate space where you experience time in a very different way. It's both excruciatingly long and then completely fleeting. So it's really interesting to see how he uses these different architectural spaces to, to make us conscious of time. Um, thinking of affliction, some of his characters have skin, skin afflictions. One, his main actress, who he uses in many of his films, is disabled. Um, and, and in Memoria, his latest film, his Tilda Swinton plays uh, an orchid farmer who suffers from exploding head syndrome, which is something that Apichapong himself suffers from. 
it's uh, it's this loud banging sound that you know is sort of a kind of a symptom of a kind of insomnia. So it's interesting how he turns this into this amazing movie about this woman who's you know going throughout going from city to city in Colombia trying to chase down the source of the sound that's in her head. Yeah, look at architecture, nature, time, and memory. Look at his films often have a two-part or a mirrored structure. But I think, I think we may be out of time. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna have Doug play the trailer for Memoria, and if we have a little more time to talk about the difference between um, watching these films in the cinema and in the galleries and what that means, we can we can go there. But we'll just watch this to start. Does does anyone have any questions or any answers? <laughs> Yeah, I kind of have an answer to the question I thought you would film. Okay. Bravo. Wait, wait, say that into the microphone. So um, I kind of have an answer for your uh, question about the short film, how to rename it. Uh, my, um, my idea is to rename short film as long, uh, uh, alongside the full, like, quote-unquote, full-length films. So I come up, came up with what's called a speed film and a space film. So these two suggest that none of them are complete, incomplete, unlike short and full length. And the only difference is the expressive capacity of these two lengths. So whether the artists choose to be speedy or the artists want to have more space to express themselves. And there's... Um, no suggestion of whether one of them is cl more care carelessness uh, on like express or quick or short, which suggests some carelessness going on over there. And also like the need to achieve, like there are a lot of intention needed to achieve speed. So that also like r sort of like stretches the speed speed films up a little bit. Awesome, thank you. Although their their short films can seem not so speedy sometimes. <laughs> thank you, Sierra, for also you know, cogitating with us about that as well. Um, other questions, uh, either collectively or individually, for these incre um, incredible curators around Kentridge or Pitchapong. Yes. I'll go here, and then your, uh, I think ushers are tracking other, other things. Keep your hands raised or raised if you do want to have one at great um, I have a question for Susan or anybody else. Um, it, it strikes me as kind of interesting that it seems like there's a theme in Kentridge, which is sort of finding the curator or, or critic uh, uh, suspect. Uh, I was struck by that first film, which I'd never seen before, of 75, which essentially says, like, the chair is the thing that really knows everything, no matter what you want to think about it, kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, so much of his work is about interpretation. And in the dual portrait one, it's almost like he doesn't even trust his own ability uh, to interpret his work. And I'm wondering if you could just sort of expand on that a little bit, because so much of his work is about interpretation and the sort of difficult to understand. But if, if he's critical of critique, sort of where do we all reside? Like, how do we find understanding if he's finding those processes suspect? You know, it's funny, I don't know that I mentioned it, but I do find that when William Kentridge gives a lecture, he's, he is really trying to distill ideas, um, thoughts. I think he has a great sense of what's wisdom. And he sets all of that up against also being able to take kind of pot shots at it, More, or I should find a better way to say that. But the films are all, and his work is filled with a great sense of um, critique. And I think that it's supposed to be read as a, as a very complex world that we live in. I think you know you could go outwards from that core, but absolutely at at both the building block level of frame to frame but also at the macro level of what are the great themes in his films i think it is constantly critiquing history his own biography um and he moves beyond south africa and his um i mean he's very interested in russian 
constructivism, art, architecture and art. And our final film on, on Thursday night, I'm really excited, we're showing his newest film, Oh to Believe in Another World. And he goes back to Shostakovich's 10th Symph Symphony and does a marvelous riff on that. So, you know, he, 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 you can tell that he, is, he loves something and he loves to be able to question it. So it's that a aspect of questioning in Kentridge's artwork that's essential. I could just um, elaborate a bit before we take that question and tacking back to the dialogue we had with Kentridge with Judith Butler, one of the most important critical theorists in the world. Critique isn't pot shots <laughs> in, in, a, in a philosophical tradition. It, it is about actually examining the assumptions um, of knowledge, of what uh, the assumptions that lie behind what we think we know about the world, at least from a certain, you know, Kant to Foucault kind of philosophical inquiry, and that's where I think he's working. So critique on the chair, the self-evidence of the chair, and all the surround that we think we know about it is, uh, is more provisional and contingent than we think, um, which is a lot more complicated than just, you know, s straight ahead suspicion. Um, all right, question up there. Just a quick question. Um, it's a really rare but interesting occasion to think Kent Ridge alongside Apichapong. Uh, but you realize the similarities too, because these two are masters of their form and they have such rich, complex bodies of work, especially like for Apichapong, the same character, the same person appears in different guises, in different films. And often you confuse the films because the same actors and the same lines are uttered and it almost seems like you're watching multiple lives of these people play out in front of your lives uh, and same for Kenridge, you know the whole entire body of work so my question for you as curators is how do you negotiate with not just bridging this cultural gap this translation this act of translation for an audience uh, but retain a sense of that ambiguity and complexity that the world that these filmmakers have made and built. Uh, and how do, you, how do you grapple with retaining and presenting films from, film, from filmmakers with such rich uh, bodies of work while keeping a sense of mystery and also curiosity intact. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can start. I mean, I feel like when I'm putting together film series, I don't know, I, I mean, film all the film series I do, the films I look at are are so complex that they 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 maintain a mystery for me even when I'm curating them, even when I'm watching them with an audience. So I think it's it's a way of asking, trying to ask the audience to be present for something in a certain way. I try not to over explicate. I try not to give things away because everyone is going to have their different experience with a work of art. So I try, hopefully, I try to sort of open up um, a little, like uh, doorways or pathways for entering a work, but I like to let the audience have their own journey because that was what was so magical for me encountering films. It was like knowing nothing and walking into a cinema and not really knowing where I was, but being amazed at at maybe the fil the film that I was seeing, and and a picture pong is his works are so rich but also so open, and I do, I do think he invites different interpretation. He often talks about his work with collaborators. I read an interview with him when he talks about how his films are are not usually marked as directed by but conceived by because. He thinks of conceiving the films in a very different, more collaborative way. And the only film I think he says it's, he, he self names as directed by is The Adventures of Iron Pussy, which he did kind of as a joke because it's, such a, it's a sort of a campy meta 
film. So I don't know if that quite gets to your question, but yeah. maybe Susan has some thoughts. You know, I just think it's important to realize that what Kate and I and our colleague Kathy Garretts do is to run a year-round Cinematheque. So across a year, we're presenting hundreds of screenings, and they all exist in a continuum so that we understand that a Pitchapong was influenced by Lynn Lai and Joseph Cornell. And to come back to Greg's first question, what were films that I helped get onto the National <laughs> Film Registry? They included Lynn Lai's Pre-Radicals, Joseph Cornell's What Mozart Saw on Mulberry Street, but also Marlon Riggs' um, Tongues Untied. Point being, um, Great artists are always speaking to the history of cinema. And many, we love programming filmmakers who are cine, cinephiles themselves. And we love working with audiences in the university to be able to show work that's very hard to come by and also to talk about it, to think about it, and to let it all resonate. And so when we're putting together either a season or a year's worth of programming, so many of the films and filmmakers are speaking um, across, across the history of cinema. And it's quite a joy to be able to, uh, to do this type of work. I think Greg has a last question. Oh, thank you. So in terms of social intervention, is it enough for me to watch a movie of uh, Peter Pong's or of uh, uh, William Kentridge's and then think, say, about buried trauma and uh, think about what that means to me? Or do I really have to go back to South Africa or to, uh, to uh, Vietnam, to um, <clears throat> Thailand and think about the specific things they're addressing in their work to understand the social intervention charge of the work? In other words, is it entirely poetic or does it have to be tied to the political in the end? I don't think you have, I think it's important to know history <laughs> and to know the references because um, you'll understand the work more deeply, but I think that it's also important to see these works as being works of poetic cinema and to think about them in an open way, just as Kate just said, to f understand the richnesses of all the things that cinema gives us as a complex art form that you don't want to have to spell out in words. You just want to be able to understand a film and to be able to see it, experience it, and think about it afterwards. Yeah. yeah. But, but I do think it is, you know, it's, it depends on you as an audience goer, but obviously everything you bring to a film is going to enrich it. So understanding the, the political situation and the context in Thailand is, is going to enrich certain aspects of your appreciation. Um, knowing film history is also going to help um, with your appreciation, but it's, so it's, it's like uh, approaching every work of art. Not everyone is able to go home and do homework about every single artwork they encounter, but if it does take you deeper, I mean, I think that's amazing. And I don't, but I don't think it's necessarily, yeah, I mean, it's when you're saying what's sufficient politically, I was also thinking it's never just sufficient politically, it's, it's not sufficiently political just to consume a film. <laughs> One has to be engaged on other levels politically. I think this is this is one of the main problems I have with documentary. I feel like it's seen as a like a replacement, a feel good replacement for actually being engaged. People can be satisfy their engagement by, you know, watching a documentary and learning something. And it's like the frozen yogurt of cinema. It's just as just as fake and fattening as ice cream, but you know, it has this sort of feeling of righteousness and that you don't have and no guilt. But, but, uh, but I think we always have to be aware of what we're seeing. And that's why it's so interesting to me to see works like a Pitchapongs that blur the boundaries between documentary. He talks about all his films as sort of his, his memories, his way of remembering things because time and memory are so mutable. You do lose things along the way. And it's, so his films are his memories, the memories of his collaborators, and all their experiences sort of distilled in these you know, moments. Thank you so much for that, those last remarks and all of the remarks about, um, that really get to the complexity of what we see on this screen thanks to the complex imaginations of curators like you who enrich um, our lives practically 365 nights a year in this theater. So I hope you can join Greg Niemeyer, Sachi Mulki, Zihan Lu, and myself in thanking these two for their time and all they do for us, Kate and Susan.
Thank you.